We pray that our program that we bring you today will bring a blessing into your life and will be meaningful. We're definitely not here just to fill space and time, but we want to share with you God's Word and trust that it will do you good. The ladies and I are so pleased that you have joined us, and we also want to comment how much we appreciate the home of Tony and Sandra Walker uh, allowing us to use it for filming purposes. Well, we're continuing on, ladies, in our 12-part series that we have called Behold the Benefits as we continue to consider the 10 benefits of the children of God listed there in Psalms 103. Today is going to be lesson number 10. We're going to deal with the subject as one of those benefits, the removal of sin, the removal of sin. Thank God that he come to save us from our sins. He didn't come to save us in our sin and leave us in our sin, but he came to save us from our sin. In other words, to bring a separation between us and our sin, that, that grand space that begins to expand and get further and further apart. I keep thinking of the little chorus that we were taught to sing as children in Sunday school, and it was gone, gone, gone. Yes, my sins are gone, buried in the sea and so forth. But it was all about our sins being gone. The Lord does not uh, say, oh, yes, I will forgive you, but I'm going to tack you the list of your sins up here on the blackboard, and if you should return to them, you know, too bad for you. He doesn't hold that account against us. When we have repented and confessed of our sins, it's so true that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness that we would read of in 1 John. Removal of sin. This is what salvation is all about, to deliver us from the clutches and the stronghold of the enemy. You see, the enemy is behind the things that cause us to sin the practices of a sinful nature. But those sins are like straps. They begin to lace themselves about our lives and pretty soon we are bound. And you probably have family members or you know someone that is truly bound by sin. I know what that is like because I grew up in a home where sin was in charge. And the individuals that I love so dearly they couldn't seem to help themselves. They were captives to the works of Satan because of the bondages, the stronghold of sin. But when we come to the Lord, he forgives us. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness, the scripture says. Then he begins to break those bondages, break those straps, those bind, binding ties that would hold us in the clutches of the control of the enemy. In a way, you know, when you're not a child of God, you're just the enemy's puppet. You're Satan's puppet. But when you give your life over to the Lord, there's a liberty. And that's what the Lord wanted to bring, is to set the captive free and uh, to undo the heavy burdens that sin can bring up on your life. The removal of sin. I'm so glad. Those sins that I have committed in my lifetime they are gone. God has removed them. And yours, my sisters in Christ, I'm sure you can testify of the same. How relieved, how glad you are to be able to rejoice and say, my sins are gone. The Lord has removed them from me. He's forgiven me and he has forgotten them. I like the word eradication. Eradication, which means to tear out by the roots, to get rid of, to wipe out. That's what the Lord came to do, is to eradicate our sin, to take it away, to take it away. We could consider, we won't turn there, ladies, but we could consider John 1, verse 29, when Jesus happened to come among the crowd as John the Baptist was ministering, and baptizing individuals who were repenting of their sin and turning their hearts back to God. And as he saw the beloved Son of God, he spoke up and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Yes, that's what Jesus came to do, is to take away, to remove the sin from off of our life. What a load is lifted. I'll never forget the time, one time when I was visiting my father 
And he had a friend there that had come to visit him who was very bound by alcohol and the clutches of the things of this world. And God just happened to give me favor in a way that I was able to talk to not only my father, who needed God in his life, but his friend about the things of God and what God could do in their life and bring a change to their life. And the man allowed me to pray for him. And you know, after he surrendered his heart and said, yes, I do want the Lord to forgive me. I do want the Lord to change me. I do want the Lord in my life. His first expression of him being a person who didn't know about the things of the Lord, he said, I feel so light. I feel free. I feel like something has been lifted off of me. Well, what was that? He was experiencing the Lord lifting and removing the weight of sin because sin gets very, very heavy to drag around, especially if you drag it around a full lifetime. So let's look at Psalms 103, verse 8 through 12, ladies, and we will see where the scripture refers to how he removes our transgressions from us. Thank God for that. It says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy and loving kindness. He will not always chide or be contending. Neither will he keep his anger forever or hold a grudge. He has not dealt with us after our sins nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great are his mercy and loving kindness toward those who reverently and worshipfully fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. You see that word removed in the 12th verse? Yes, this is telling us one of the benefits of coming to the Lord and giving your life to him and letting him be your Lord and your Savior is the fact that he will remove your sin from you as far as the east is from the west. You say, well, Carol, how far is that? How, how much distance is there between the east and the west? Well, they say that the east and the west can never meet. When our sins are forgiven and removed from us, thank God the Lord doesn't even remember it anymore. That's, that's amazing. That's hard to comprehend how that God puts our sin so far from us that he does not even remember it himself against us. It's like a memory loss. Thank God for that. Ah, it would be terrible if we related to a God who just set our sins to the side to wait and see if we were going to slip up again and then bring up all that backwash of the past. But no, it's buried, it's gone. Let's go to some scriptures, ladies, that you should have uh, marked in your Bible, especially as you witness to others and want to lead others to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. We could go to the Amplified Version of Micah 7, verse 18 to 19, and we would see that he casts our sins where? Where does he put them? The scripture says he puts them into the depths of the sea. Who is a God like you who forgives iniquity and passes over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retains not his anger forever because he delights in mercy and loving kindness. He will again have compassion on us he will subdue and tread underfoot our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. That should be sufficient, shouldn't it? That they be buried in the depths of the sea. And you know there are places, they say, in the ocean that is so deep. The pressure of the water is so great as they get deeper and deeper into its depths and, and begin to fathom its depths. Thank God our sins are buried we need to let God keep them buried and not keep bringing them back up. And when Satan tries to bring back to our remembrance the things that we have done that we've asked God to forgive us of, we need to rebuke him. And like uh, Jesus said to him, said, Satan, get thee behind me and command Satan to get behind you and rebuke and refuse to entertain the backwash that he wants to bring to your memory of that awful thing perhaps that was in your past. Let's see another verse, ladies, another good one that you should have marked in your Bible to share with others, especially those who feel so condemned because of things that they have done. You may say, but Carol, I've never done anything really terrible. You know, I've done this or that, or I've failed to do this or that. I'm not, I've never been a big, big sinner. Well, I can't say I have either because I've walked with the Lord since a little child. But you know what? We all sin 
and come short of the glory of God. It isn't a matter of little sins and big sins and which ones, uh, you know, we're going to get the most lashings for. No, sin is sin, and that's coming short of what God has asked and desires of us. Let's look at Isaiah, the 38th chapter, verse 17. It says, Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. So, in a sense, the Lord has cast our sin to the depth of the sea, not the shallow shore where it can just keep washing back and forth, back and, uh, coming back and forth up on the, on the seashore, but it's out in the depth of the sea. But also, it's the same as him casting it behind his back. In other words, he's not going to be looking at it. He's not going to be concerned about it as to you suffering the retribution for those things that you have done, that you've asked God to forgive you for. Now, I think it's a different story when you have failed to humble your heart and say, God, I was wrong for this or that, and you begin to figure, oh, well, God will just overlook it. It's no big deal. Then don't expect much of God as far as him cleansing you and forgiving you and forgetting it. But you need to come before the Lord and truly repent and be grateful for your sin and let the Lord know you were sorry for your sin and you want his forgiveness and you want his cleansing. Isaiah 43, verse 25, in the Amplified, it says, I, even I, am he who blots out and cancels your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Oh, thank God, our sins are blotted out. Our sins, in a sense, are erased as if they were listed on a great chalkboard. And one by one, the Lord begins to erase those sins, those lists of those sins. He said, I will blot them out. I will cancel them. I will remember them no more. I'm so thankful for that. And don't let Satan remind you of them either, those that you have repented of. Be specific in your prayer. Be sincere in your prayer when you want sin to be removed. Some of you listening to me, no doubt, you are bound by habits and things of your nature that you need deliverance from. The Lord wants to set you free. He wants to deliver you from those bondages. Bring yourself holy intentionally to the Lord with an honest, sincere heart of repentance and ask the Lord to set you free and to uh, make a difference to give you a new nature. You know, if you're really struggling and you've prayed about these matters and you haven't gotten the help, uh, maybe as far as your faith to believe that you will be delivered of those sins, then maybe you should go to perhaps the house of God somewhere or to individuals that you know, walk in a godly walk with God and could pray with you and for you and help you and assist you in being really delivered from perhaps some habits that you know are displeasing to the Lord or very much a hazard to your own health or your life, or maybe a hurt and a harm to your family. Get some spiritual help. That's one reason we do need a home church. We do need pastoral ministry as well as teaching ministry such as you get on television. But we do need that body of Christ to help support us and to back us and encourage us when we are struggling with getting victory in our life. And there's those who seemingly just seem to have victory from, from, the, from the start. And then there's those who seem to have a, a more of a progressive sense of deliverance. But if you're in the pattern of needing that added help, please don't hesitate to get spiritual help. It takes a little humility, but humility is good for us. Why? Does God for, forgive us our sin? Why does God say, I'm not even going to hold it against you. I'm not going to remember it anymore. Well, let's look at some of these factors in that verse 8 and verse 9 again. This shows us God's nature. And it says in verse 8, it says, the Lord's merciful and gracious. That's why. That's why he can do it. And he's slow to anger. That's why he can do it. And it says he's plenteous in mercy and loving kindness. You see, this is the nature of God. And that's why he's a God that can and will forgive and wants to forgive and wants you to be free and not be tormented by those things that condemn you. Verse 9 says he'll not always chide or be contending. In other words, he's not going to strive with you. 
and, and that he won't keep his anger forever or hold a grudge. Aren't you glad for that, that God is not like some people who hold their anger and they just let it simmer, simmer, simmer until finally it explodes? Or they hold a grudge forever? They may say with their mouth, well, I forgive you, but they really don't in their heart and they hold that grudge against you. And verse 10 says how he hasn't dealt with us, you know, equally to the degree of our sin, but he, he has rewarded us, you know, less than what our sin really deserved. Verse 11 says, as high as the heavens is above the earth, that's how great his mercy is, his loving kindness is. And this is for those who, those who reverently and worshipfully fear him. This has to do with our attitude about God. We need to have the reverential awe of who God really is. The fear of God and know that God is God. We don't bring him down to a human level, but we honor him because he is the one exalted on high. Worship him, revere him in your heart, and God can bring this benefit into your life of the removal of your sin. As far as the east is from the west, praise the Lord. Do you know, in this particular generation, it seems that we've made sin into a joke. We've made the subject of sin into a light, a very light matter. And it's more a matter of relativism, of saying, well, that's relative, or that's not relative. Or, you know, as though, well, everybody does it. Or I have an attitude like my peers. We begin to make excuses for sins. But do you know, sin cost the father a great price. He gave up his only begotten son who came from the bosom of the father, the scripture says, in order that our sin might be removed. That's what the cross is all about. It was for the sake of the removal of sin. Him being that lamb of God, as John prophetically spoke, John the Baptist, that lamb of God that would take away, carry off, and take away from the sins of the world. Not just for certain cultures, certain societies, certain classes of people. Oh no, but for the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish. But that they would have everlasting life. But you know if sin is in the roadblock, it's in the way. Then, you know, there isn't going to be the everlasting life. The sin has got to be removed because God cannot tolerate sin. And there will be no sin enter into the city of God. The scripture says our sin has got to be forgiven, forgotten. It has got to be removed from us so that we can truly be a part of the kingdom of God. And his kingdom will come, the scripture says. And his will will be done in earth, even as it is in heaven. And what a great day that's going to be. When he sets up his kingdom on this earth, and we are so privileged to rule and reign with Christ. But sin will not be showing its ugly face there. It will be about godliness because of the graces of Christ applied to our life. I'm so thankful that God has a nature different than man in that sense. We've made sin out to be a light thing, but you know, to God, it's very re repelling. Do you know God goes so far in his word to say that to him it smells, it's like vomit in his presence? You say, Carol, you sound very crude. Well, let's just let God talk in his word, okay? Let's go to Isaiah 28, verse 8, ladies, in the King James. And here he's speaking about the people of Jerusalem. His own people have gotten to a place even among the spiritual leadership of that day. As Isaiah was called to minister to the crowd in his generation. And this is what God says through him. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that, that there is no place clean. Here it was speaking of God's people, yes. And it was speaking of even those that were involved in the spiritual leadership of that society. And he says that their tables are full of vomit and filthiness. It was a stench in the nostrils of God. Sin to God is very repulsive. And then we can go to Isaiah again in chapter 1, verse 6, ladies. And this is what the Lord speaks of, what sin is to him. From the sole of the foot even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds 
and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, nor mollified with ointment. In other words, there has been no process set in motion, even for the healing of these putrefying sores. Now, when you have a putrefying sore, that is something very smelly, very foul. So keep in mind that to God, sin is repulsive. It's not a light issue with God. We could read in Ezekiel the 16th chapter, and I would encourage you ladies, take that and read it sometime when you have a lot of time to really ponder and pray and see what the Spirit speaks to you. It's a beautiful illustration the Lord gives here of what he had done for his people and how he found them in such a deplorable state and yet how he changed their life and transformed their life by removing the pollution of their sin. And now I'm going to read verses uh, 4 through 6, verse 9 through 13 to save time. Ezekiel 16, the Amplified Version. And again, this is a picture that the Lord is drawing here about his people and what he had done for them to change their lifestyle. It says, And as for your birth, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut. Nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt or swaddled with bands at all. No, I pitied you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you. But you were cast out in the open field, for your person was abhorrent and loathsome on the day that you were born. And when I passed by you and saw you rolling about in your blood, I said to you in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you still in your natal blood, live. Then I washed you with water. Yes, I thoroughly washed away your clinging blood from you, and I anointed you with oil. I clothed you also with embroidered cloth and shod you with fine silk leather. And I girded you about with fine linen and covered you with silk. I decked you also with ornaments, and I put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. And I had put a ring on your nostrils and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were decked with gold and silver, and your raiment was of fine linen and silk and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour and honey and oil, and you were exceedingly beautiful. And you prospered into a royal estate. What a beautiful picture. And, and we could take that and make um, probably more than one lesson out of it. How that, as a symbol, the Lord has used this picture of one that has been born and just abandoned, thrown out into an open field, not, not put in a hospital for, you know, special sanitary birth, no, but a baby that was abandoned. And we hear how this happens fairly often sad to say, and how that she was there uh, polluted in her blood and unclean. She hadn't been washed. Even the navel cord hadn't been cut. And all these things have symbolic meaning if we had the time to go into it, which that isn't the main issue of our lesson today. But how that he, he, he went by her, he had compassion on her, and he said to her, live. She would have died in that open field, a baby abandoned like that, unkept, unprepped for life. She would, have, she would have died, but he said, live, live. He spoke to her the words of life. And then he took that, that babe and he washed her and got her all clean with all the bloody mess off. And he began to anoint her and clothe her and put shoes on her feet, give her ornaments, a crown and so forth, and feed her with these wonderful fine things uh, to eat upon the flour, the honey, the oil, and so forth. And she began to grow and prosper into the kingdom. Well, that's a picture of what the Lord does for us when he removes our sin, our abhorrent, unclean sin. And he begins to prepare us to become, as it were, daughters and sons of the kingdom of God. Well, pollution is removed when our sins are removed far from us. Thank God. Thank God. He doesn't collect them and keep them in a chest somewhere to just wait and see if we should fail again or go back. But he forgets, he forgives, he gives us hope for a future. Now, we need to be reasonable, don't we? With this benefit being offered to us, that our sins will be removed. We want to conclude, ladies, with Isaiah 1, verse 18. The words of the Lord through the prophet says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. In other words, let's be reasonable. Come, let's reason this together. I'll make an exchange. 
Your sins may be just as loud as scarlet. They may be just as loud as the color crimson. But I can make them clean and white like the snow, even like on Mount Hermon that is so famous for being covered all year long, beautiful at its crown. And though they be as red as crimson, the Lord says he'll make it look just like wool when wool has been cleansed. Precious one, maybe you're carrying sin in your life today and you need to know that the Lord loves you. He cares about the condition you're in. He wants to forgive you. He wants to cleanse you. He wants to change your life. Come to him. And say, Lord, I receive. Lord, I receive. Forgive me. Cleanse me, O God. And make me a child of God. Give me a new life. Walk and live in and through me. Join us next time, my friend, as we deal with the subject of the benefit of God's compassion. Let flowers bloom. Program copies available. Full set of 12 lessons on CDs, $34. DVDs, $44. Add $3 for shipping and handling, no COD. For more information, please contact Carol Brook Ministries Incorporated, P.O. Box 1909, Alpine, California, 91903. On the internet, visit www.carolbrookministries.com or email carolbrook at carolbrookministries.com. Prayer line number 541-592-4539, Pacific Time, 8 a.m. through 8 p.m.